This is the eighth in a series of videos on glaucoma. Module eight, assessment of IOP, intraocular pressure. The learning objectives for this module are, one, to understand why high intraocular pressure is a risk factor for glaucoma. Two, to understand the advantages and disadvantages of different types of tonometer. Three, to know how to use tonometers to measure IOP. And four, to understand the relationship between corneal thickness and IOP. A high intraocular pressure, IOP, measurement is often one of the first signs an eye care professional will identify in a patient at risk of glaucoma. In this unit, you will look at the accurate use of contact and non-contact tonometers in the detection of ocular hypertension, OHT, and glaucoma. You will also consider when a patient with raised pressure should be considered at risk of glaucoma. NICE is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in England. NICE NG81 guidelines offer specific recommendations around the measurement of IOP and the referral of patients with OHT. NICE updated the guidance around IOP in 2017 with new requirements in relation to diagnosis, referral and management of glaucoma and glaucoma suspects. Whilst aimed at eye care professionals working in England, these guidelines represent a good standard to be used in other eye health systems and are referenced in this lecture. However, you may need to follow different local protocols. NICE guideline 1.1.4 recommends repeat testing if there is a suspect finding. Before deciding to refer, consider repeating visual field assessment and IOP measurement on another occasion to confirm a visual field defect or IOP of 24 millimeters of mercury or more, unless clinical circumstances indicate urgent or emergency referral is needed. NICE guideline 1.1.5 then gives recommendations on when to refer. Refer for further investigation and diagnosis of chronic open angle glaucoma and related conditions after considering repeat measures as in recommendation 1.1.4. If there is optic nerve head damage on stereoscopic slit lamp biomicroscopy, or there is a visual field defect consistent with glaucoma, or IOP is 24 millimeters of mercury or more using Goldman type applanation tonometry. And the next two guidelines are 1.1.6 provide results of all examinations and tests with the referral, and 1.1.7, advise people with IOP below 24 millimeters of mercury to continue regular visits to their primary eye care professional. Statistically, population studies show that normal intraocular pressure is between 10 and 21 millimetres of mercury. About 95% of the UK population is within this range. Ocular hypertension is a term used when the IOP is consistently elevated above 21 millimetres of mercury, but there is an absence of optic nerve damage or visual field defects. In the UK, Guidance used to be to refer anyone with a pressure of over 21. This resulted in too many referrals, hence the change in the NICE guidance. The recommendation is now that those with IOPs of 22 or 23 
should have an annual eye examination. This is a diagram of pressure arising in the eye. If aqueous outflow through the trabecular meshwork is reduced, too much fluid stays in the eye and IOP increases. High pressure damages the optic nerve, leading to a progressive loss of visual function. So what causes IOP to vary? It is normal for the pressure in the eye to vary during the day, and you would expect to see a diurnal variation of three to six millimeters of mercury. In patients with glaucoma, the diurnal variation can actually be much greater. Heart rate, respiration, caffeine consumption, alcohol consumption, and exercise can all affect intraocular pressure in the short term. Systemic medication and topical medication can also affect variation, and this is why topical medication is used to bring down the pressure when treating glaucoma. This is a graph showing the typical IOP diurnal variation and the nocturnal dip. Asymmetric IOP. It is generally assumed that IOP should be the same in both eyes. IOP asymmetry is considered to be a risk factor for glaucoma. And the greater the inter-eye IOP difference, the greater the risk of glaucoma. A difference of 1 to 2 millimetres of mercury is not considered significant. In patients with glaucoma, IOP asymmetry is a common finding, and there is a direct relationship between the amount of IOP asymmetry and the likelihood of having glaucoma. A difference of 3 millimetres of mercury is associated with a 6% probability of having glaucoma. A difference of 6 millimetres of mercury or greater is associated with a 57% probability of having glaucoma. Short-term factors affecting IOP. A variety of factors affect IOP both briefly and over time. Be aware of short-term factors because they may affect IOP measurements to a surprising degree. Fluid intake, blood pressure, exertion and posture can all influence a reading. The arterial pulse, ocular pulse, can influence a variation of 3 to 4 millimetres of mercury. Repeat readings ideally at a different time of day, are recommended to help eliminate referral on the basis of a false positive reading. Drinking water or coffee or wearing a tight neck collar or tie can increase IOP. Drinking alcohol and aerobic exercise can reduce IOP. Being tense or nervous during the test can also increase eye pressure. Reassure and relax the patient as the contraction of the extraocular and intraocular muscles can raise IOP. Note, however, that IOP is higher when lying down, so where possible, ensure the patient is sitting upright. Long-term effects uh, on IOP. The long-term factors influencing IOP are the ones more likely to be associated with the risk of developing primary open angle glaucoma. Myopia is associated with increased IOP, although the reasons are not fully understood. Corneal characteristics such as curvature, elasticity and hydration properties, systemic disease, hypertension, and other ocular diseases, such as anterior uveitis and retinal detachments, 
all have an impact on IOP. IOP increases as age increases, and IOP tends to be higher in people of African and Asian heritage. A family history of glaucoma increases the risk of raised IOP, and raised IOP is more prevalent in females. The importance of measuring IOP accurately. IOP is determined using tonometry, one of the principal tests for glaucoma. Applanation tonometers measure the force required to flatten a known area of the cornea. The Imbert Fick principle states that the pressure inside a globe equals the force necessary to flatten its surface divided by the area of flattening. P equals F over A, where P is the pressure, F is the force, and A is the area. Most tonometers are calibrated to measure pressure in millimetres of mercury, mmHg. Repeat readings. NICE guidelines includes recommendations for repeat readings. NICE recommends repeating IOP measurement on another occasion using Goldman type applanation tonometry to confirm if IOP is 24 millimetres of mercury or more, unless clinical circumstances indicate urgent or emergency referral is needed. Specify the type of tonometer and the time of measurement in your referral notes. Case study one, Janet Smith. Take a look at Janet's IOP readings, bearing in mind what we already know about her. She is 72. She is white European. Her mother was diagnosed with glaucoma in her 70s. She has no reported medical history. Her IOP is 18 millimetres of mercury in both eyes. And her central corneal thickness in the right eye is 4922 micrometres and the left eye 487. Janet's IOP is within the normal range, but she still falls into a number of risk categories for OHT and glaucoma. Based on the information you have about Janet, select the four risk factors that would apply to her. Is it her age, gender, health conditions, ethnicity, family history of glaucoma, or central corneal thickness? The correct answers are age, her gender, family history of glaucoma, and her central corneal thickness. IOP increases with age, and high IOP is more likely in females. A family history of glaucoma and thinner corneas also increase her risk of raised IOP. Consider Janet's IOPs along with her individual circumstances. What does this tell you about the IOP measurement as an indicator of glaucoma risk? Well, Janet's IOP readings are a reminder that while IOP is a good indicator of glaucoma risk, it is not the only risk factor. In cases where IOP is within the normal range, other significant risk factors should also be taken into account. Tonometry, measuring IOP. The Schiotz tonometer. It's well suited for use in remote clinics and for screening. It is inexpensive, simple to use and durable. However, it is less accurate than other types of tonometer. 
The shot tonometer consists of a hollow barrel with a concave foot plate and a holder. A free floating rod like plunger with a 5.5 gram weight attached fits inside the barrel. When held vertically on top of the eye, the plunger will move downwards by gravity and indent the cornea. This very small up and down movement is magnified by a lever arm to move a needle that gives a reading on a horizontal scale numbered arbitrarily 0 to 20. A firmer eye, due to higher IOP, will result in a lower indentation and a lower reading on the scale. A conversion table supplied with the instrument is used to translate scale readings into estimates of IOP in millimetres of mercury. To account for the range of pressure, other weights, typically 7.5 grams and 10 grams, are supplied that can be added to the plunger. Cleaning of the barrel and the plunger should be done once a day to prevent the plunger from sticking to the barrel. In between patients, the shot tonometer should be disinfected by soaking it in sodium hypochlorite. Full instructions on using a shot tonometer are in the article shown here in the Community Eye Health Journal, Understanding and Caring for a Shot Tonometer. You can find this resource at cehjournal.org. Goldman Applination Tonometry GAT is widely considered to be the gold standard in tonometry. It is always used in a hospital setting and is the method of choice for determining IOP. The robust, simple design is quick and easy to use, but precision is required, so a thorough knowledge of preparation and use is essential. Before the examination, ensure your hands are thoroughly clean and all instruments are wiped down. Check that the calibrated measurement dial of the tonometer is set at 10 millimetres of mercury. Use a disposable tonometer prism if available, e.g. tonosafe. The procedure should be carried out in a darkened room with a wide beam and a cobalt blue filter. Set the angle of the beam at 60 degrees and the slit lamp magnification at 10 times. Talk the patient through the procedure, ensuring that they understand and consent to the contact element of the test. Make sure the patient is sitting comfortably at the slit lamp with their chin on the chin rest, forehead on the bar, and their eyes in line with the alignment marker. Check for active surface pathology by checking the cornea on the slit lamp. Use a local anaesthetic such as proxymetacaine and then follow with a small amount of fluorescein. To measure IOP, ask the patient to look straight ahead with both eyes open wide sitting very still. Their forehead should be against the rest. If required, gently hold the patient's eyelids apart with your thumb and index finger without putting pressure on the eye. Slowly move the tonometer forward until the prism is gently resting on the cornea. As you look through the microscope, Turn the calibrated tonometer dial until the two fluorescein semicircles in the prism head meet and form a distinctive horizontal S shape. The alignment is correct if the inner edges of the semicircles touch. When you are satisfied that the alignment is correct, record the reading on the dial in your notes. Multiply the reading on the dial by 10 to convert to millimetres of mercury 
for IOP. Withdraw the prism from the corneal surface and wipe the tip before repeating the procedure on the other eye. Finally, check both corneas for any staining. The Perkins handheld applination tonometer is widely used by eye care professionals in the community. Readings generally compare well to GAT. It functions in the same way as GAT, as it is essentially a handheld version. It is useful where patients can't sit at a slit lamp and on outreach. The patient will ideally sit in a chair with their head supported. You will also ensure that you are in a stable position with a steady hand. The headrest is placed on the patient's forehead and carefully moved until the prism is aligned with the eye. Align the Myers and take the reading in the same way that you would using GAT. Aligning the Myers correctly. Practice is required to adjust the tonometer to the correct pressure. Small movements can be made while on the eye, but if larger movements are required to centre the prism, the tonometer should be moved back from the eye and re-centred before touching the eye again. It is also important to instil the correct amount of fluorescein. In the top image, the Myers are too far apart and you would need to increase the dial reading. In the bottom image, the Myers are too high, pull back and lower the tonometer prism. In this top image, there's too much fluorescein. Dab the eyes with a tissue. And in the bottom image, the instrument probe must be moved right. The top image in this slide shows Myers that are too close. You need to reduce the dial reading. And in the bottom image, the Myers are too low. Pull back and raise the tonometer prism. In this slide, the top image shows too little fluorescein. You need to add some more. And in the bottom image, this is the correct force. The innermost aspects of the two semicircles are touching. Errors in tonometry. It is possible to make a number of errors when examining the eye using a contact tonometer, regardless of the type used, and they can all have a negative impact on the accuracy of the result. Most errors are avoidable or easy to correct if you have a good understanding of the process and develop a consistent technique. In addition to a variety of technical errors, it is most important to ensure patient comfort and offer reassurance as discussed earlier. Lids touching the probe. Keep the eyelids away from the probe to avoid an increase in the IOP reading. If you are holding the lids apart, take care not to apply pressure to the globe, as this will also affect the IOP reading, giving a false high error. Surface ten tension force altered, minimal. Surface tension force must be just right to view correctly. The Myers images show how the size of rings change as force is varied. Prolonged contact or repeated readings. Repeated readings may induce a decline in IOP. Corneal astigmatism greater than three diopters. Astigmatism greater than three diopters may cause an elliptical area of corneal contact. Technically, the flattest corneal meridian should be aligned at 43 degrees 
to the apex of the tonometer cone. Although taking the average of readings with the prism orientated horizontally and vertically may suffice in practice. Incorrect vertical alignment. This can make the IOP appear higher than it is and is easily spotted by the semicircles being of uneven sizes. Calibration. Miscalibration will result in systematic IOP measurement inaccuracies, even if the rest of your technique is flawless. Instruments should be calibrated at a minimum biannually. Many protocols recommend monthly calibration, but the frequency depends on usage. Observer errors. Inter and intra observer variability can vary by two to three millimeters of mercury due to the subjective nature of the optical end point. Meniscus width. Thickness of fluorescein ring is important. Ideally, it should be about a tenth of a diameter of the cone, 0.3 millimeters. Excessive fluorescein, two millimeters, raises IOP estimates by around two millimeters of mercury. An insufficient fluorescein ring, less than 0.1 millimeters, lowers IOP estimates by around 0.35. Non-contact tonometry, NCT. In non-contact tonometry, the applinating medium is a brief controlled air pulse. NCTs are often found in community settings and can be used by non-clinical staff. No anaesthetic is required and they are generally considered less accurate than contact tonometers. They are also called air puff tonometers. Like other procedures, the practical aspects of non-contact tonometry should be explained to the patient. You can demonstrate the puff of air on your patient's hand to reassure them as you want the patient to be relaxed. Make sure your patient is breathing normally with no tight clothing around the neck. Before considering a referral based on non-contact tonometry alone, take at least three readings per eye and use the mean as a result. This will help to account for the ocular pulse, which can make the reading vary depending on where in the cycle the measurement is taken. If the average is 24 millimetres of mercury or above, the measurements should be taken again on a separate occasion. Research into normal eyes shows that the mean of subsequent sets of readings will often be within the normal range. Only consider referring the patient for further assessment when the mean result is 24 millimetres of mercury or above if this is the only abnormality found. Ideally, you should repeat suspect readings with a contact tonometer as recommended in NICE NG81. Note also that local guidelines may vary and they should always be followed. Make sure you know the local pathway for referral for where you work. Rebound tonometry. A rebound tonometer is a compact handheld device using single use disposable probes. No anaesthetic is required. It determines intraocular pressure by bouncing a small plastic tipped metal probe against the cornea. An induction coil magnetizes the probe and fires it against the cornea. As the probe bounces against the cornea and back into the device, it creates an induction current from which the intraocular pressure is calculated. The device is simple and easy to use 
but the measurement is not as reliably accurate as GATT, varying by plus 2.8 millimetres of mercury. The image shows an eye care tonometer. Rebound tonometry is suitable for use with children, in outreach and domiciliary work or with patients who are unable to engage with an application tonometer. Many community optometrists in the UK now use this as the first choice over NCT as patients often prefer it. If necessary, repeat with GAT on another occasion. A disadvantage is the cost of the probes which are designed for single use. Pros and cons of tonometry methods. Shots tonometry. Pros are inexpensive, simple to use, durable, requires little maintenance, and does not have electronics and does not require batteries. Cons are that it's less accurate than other types of tonometers. Contact tonometry. Pros are that it's considered the gold standard with very accurate measurements. And the cons are that it requires careful setup. It does require regular use to maintain higher skill level. It's non-portable if it's a goldman. It's not available in all community optometrists. Anesthetic and fluorescein are required and the cost of disposable heads if that's what's being used. Non-contact tonometry, NCT. The pros of this are no contact with the cornea, it's very quick, non-clinical staff can be trained to use it, and anesthesia is not required. Cons are not as accurate as GAT, and repeat measure required three times to calculate the mean average. Rebound tonometry. Pros being contact with the cornea is very brief, simple and easy to use, portable, anesthesia is not required, and it's often preferred by patients and particularly useful with children and those unable to engage with GAT. The cons are that it would be less accurate than GAT and the cost of the probes. Ocular blood flow tonometry. An ocular blood flow tonometer examines the role of ischemia in the development of glaucoma, which can be associated with blood volume supplied to the eye during cardiac cycles. It is a quickly performed technique which provides information about IOP fluctuation over time. It is only likely to be found in tertiary centres. The measurements recorded are IOP, pulse amplitude, pulse volume, pulse rate, and ocular blood flow. This information can be helpful in understanding the vascular etiology of primary open angle glaucoma and normal tension glaucoma. Central corneal thickness and IOP. Central corneal thickness, CCT, is measured using a pachymeter or OCT. A normal healthy cornea has a th thickness of 540 to 560 micrometers. In the center, becoming thicker towards the periphery, typically 710 to 800 micrometers. Corneas with CCT less than 535 are considered thin. Corneas with CCT greater than 565 are considered thick. Having a thin CCT is believed to be an independent risk factor in glaucoma and a strong predictor of the development of primary open angle glaucoma. The Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study, OATS, found that patients diagnosed with ocular hypertension who had a thin cornea 
had three times the risk of developing glaucoma. Corneal thickness is important because it can mask an accurate reading of IOP. All pachymeters are calibrated for an average CCT. A thin cornea can show an artificially low IOP reading, leading to underdiagnosis of glaucoma, or patients being monitored for ocular hypertension who would be better given treatment. A study has shown that CCT values in African populations are less than those of whites. This could lead to an underdiagnosis of glaucoma depending on referral protocols. A thick cornea gives an artificially high reading of IOP, which could lead to unnecessary treatment. A CCT measurement is important because a thinner cornea can lead to an underestimation of IOP and a thicker cornea can lead to an overestimation of IOP. The measurement should be factored in when considering the patient's lifetime risk of developing glaucoma. Pachymetry. A pachymeter measures the thickness of the cornea. The most common type is handheld and uses ultrasound to make measurements. It is recommended that you measure CCT in both eyes, preferably before dilation, but after you have measured IOP. Using a handheld pachymeter. Rotate the ultrasound probe to the desired position, then hold it perpendicular to the cornea and centered on the pupil. Ask your patient to visualize a fixation point and position the tip of the probe onto the cornea. Once aligned properly, the pachymeter will automatically begin taking a series of measurements. Take a minimum of three readings. It is good practice to record the device name and time of day. Note that lateral displacement of the probe away from the centre of the eye will give you readings that are elevated compared to the true CCT value. Case study 2. Richard Palmer. Take a look at Richard's IOP and CCT results bearing in mind what we already know about him. Richard is 48, Afro-Caribbean, his mother has glaucoma, he has no reported medical history, he has an open anterior chamber angle on gonioscopy, his IOPs are right eye 16 millimetres of mercury and left eye 15 millimetres of mercury, the CCT in his right eye is 500 micrometers and that in his left eye 501. What can you say about Richard's CCT measurements? Either his corneas are within the normal range for corneal thickness or his corneas are thicker than average or his corneas are thinner than average. How will Richard's CCT measurements affect his IOP readings? Either his CCT measurements will not affect them, or his CCT measurements affect the accuracy of the IOP reading by up to 8 millimetres of mercury, and his CCT measurements are likely to lead to lower IOP readings than the true value. The correct answer is his CCT measurements are likely to lead to lower IOP readings than the true value. A thinner CCT is a risk factor with an estimated three times greater risk of developing glaucoma. Where CCT information is available, it can be useful in informing the referral decision. In Richard's case, it could be factored in when considering his lifetime risk of developing glaucoma. In summary, measuring IOP is important in the context of glaucoma detection and where possible, a Goldman type 
applanation tonometer should be used to take IOP measurements. NICE provides clear guidance for referral based on IOP readings. These are for optometrists working in England, but can be useful in other eye health systems. Remember that local protocols on referral pathways should also be known. CCT measured using a pachymeter can help inform a patient's lifetime risk of developing glaucoma. People of African ethnicity have thinner corneas than people of European ethnicity, which may need to be taken into account when considering IOP readings. Check that you have achieved the learning outcomes for this module. That you understand why high intraocular pressure is a risk factor for glaucoma. That you understand the advantages and disadvantages of different types of tonometer. That you know how to use tonometers to measure IOP. And that you understand the relationship between corneal thickness and intraocular pressure. Make sure to have any questions that you have answered.